you know, that sort of bigger picture mentality. You know, you're not just your sport, you're not just yourself as an athlete, but you're one country representing, you know, our nation. Sports always played a massive role in my life and that was what was missing once I come out of the hospital system and I'd acquired my disability and sitting there at home going, right, what now? What's my purpose now? Um, and, you know, sport gave me a vehicle to go and achieve some small goals. I think end of the day, I just want to leave a legacy. I'm getting on, it's my third games, um, could be my last. Um, I just want to leave a, leave a legacy in the sport that we are the best at it. You know, Australia is the best wheelchair rugby team in the world. You realise that sport teaches you a huge amount about who you are and what you believe in. It's really going to be the people who deal best with adversity who do the best at these games. You know, those who go prepared and who are comfortable with their own thoughts, um, I think are going to be the ones who really relish the opportunity to get out there and, and compete. Pete, Pete. Welcome to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Our mission is to protect the integrity of sport and the health and welfare of those who participate in Australian sport. Hello and welcome to Sport Integrity Australia's Clean and Gold podcast series in the lead up to the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. I'm Tim Gable and alongside me is the triple Olympic gold medalist Patria Thomas and today we'll be joined by the Rio Olympic gold medalist in rowing Kim Brennan and Patria, uh, incredible journey there for Kim Brennan. She started off as a, as a track and field athlete got injured, went into rowing, won an Olympic gold medal in Rio in the single skulls, almost sunk the boat though in the choppy waters in the heats and only just scraped through to the final where she, she won the final. She was the reigning world champion, so high expectations, but um, sometimes things don't go to plan, do they? No, that's right, Tim, they definitely don't. And uh, it's, it's really, when you get to that level of elite sport, it's about who can handle the adversity the best and deal with the unexpected things that happen along the way. And uh, that's a real key. And um, Kim, you know, is an ultimate competitor and um, was able to overcome those challenges. Did you have to overcome any challenges at the last minute like that? Uh, conditions um, and, and I guess the unexpected to a certain extent? Yeah, absolutely. Um, during my career, I'm sure I had a fair few pairs of goggles break in the marshalling area. And, you, you know, you're always supposed to have spares in your pocket and things that sometimes you don't. Um, so there's been many things like that over the years. Um, I re actually remember in the lead up to the uh, 1996 uh, Olympic Games, the 200 butterfly final, we were waiting in the marshalling area. Um, and uh, Michelle Smith from Ireland, who has uh, was subsequently caught for, for doping, um, was actually late to the marshalling area and um, we were all ready to go and walk out and we were like, come on, let's go, we don't need her to race and because there was a lot of suspicion around yeah. her performances at the time and um, I think she broke a pair of goggles or something and left the marshalling area and we were, basically we started walking out without her and then she came onto the pool deck later. Um, but, um, you know, things like that, they just happen, they're unexpected and, and you've just got to stay in the right mindset and uh, be focused on what you need to do to perform. And, and you prepare for that though, don't you? Yeah, you do. You prepare as best you can, um, but you never know what's going to happen and that's, that's the challenge of it. Um, you've got to be um, agile and flexible and, um, you know, ready to, uh, I suppose, just keep that mindset and focus that you, you know what you have to do to, to perform. Good on you, Patria. In a moment, we'll be having a chat to Chris and also Kim Brennan. And um, if we're going to have a chat to Chris Bond. He's the Paralympic wheelchair rugby gold medalist. That's a tough sport. Yeah, it's a crazy sport, that one. Uh, it's pretty amazing to watch. I've, I've, I've seen them train a yeah. few times and uh, it's... Um, yeah, brutal. Yeah, it's very brutal, but very physical and it's very skillful as well. Thanks, Patria. Uh, back with more in just a moment. 15 seconds is all that's available for the United States to hold on. They were in exactly the same position at the end of the fourth period of play, and they found a way with just under two seconds. Can they do a double dip of it, or is it double trouble? Here comes Aoki. It's up to Melton. Melton's got Bond on him inside to Wheeler, but Wheeler has left the field of play. They call it against the Americans. He leaves the court before the ball's been received. Australia with the inbound inside of 3.6 seconds. They will play from in front of their own bench. It's up to Bats. Bat will take it across the line. 
and it's over. They will win the gold medal. Australia, the first team with back-to-back -back gold medals in the wheelchair rugby. And what a moment as they do it in extra time. The second period, whoa, gold medal glory for Australia. Hello, I'm Tim Gable. Alongside me is the triple Olympic gold medalist, Patria Thomas. And joining us now on the Clean and Gold series is Paralympian Chris Bond. Chris won gold in the men's wheelchair rugby at both the 2012 London and 2016 Rio Paralympics. He has an extraordinary record in the sport. He's now preparing for the Tokyo Paralympics. And Chris, I guess firstly, how hard has it been preparing for Tokyo given the, the COVID pandemic? Because you wouldn't have been able to play other international teams over the last couple of years. Yeah, it's been very difficult, Tim. Um, I guess just to start, wheelchair rugby is a mixed sport. Um, so men and women compete um, together, yeah. um, which is kind of unique and very interesting for a full contact sport. Um, but yeah, look, it's, you know, I can't even remember the last time I played internationally. It's been that long. Um, and it's been, you know, quite tough given last year. There's just so much uncertainty for over 12 months now where they you know, our main event being the Paralympic Games will actually go ahead, what it's going to look like, um, and trying to prepare mentally and physically. Uh, it's been a bit of a challenge. We've, we've actually had a couple, well, one athlete at this point in our squad pull out um, of the Paralympic Games for, for health reasons, and we've had two staff members in our initial team sort of pull out for other reasons. So uh, it's a strange time uh, to be an elite athlete and uh, to be representing Australia. So, Chris, um uh, what are you looking forward to most about um, playing in Tokyo potentially? I think it's just that chance to, to wear the green and gold again. As I said, it's been so long just to be able to put that on and and give everything we can for our country. It's kind of, you know, as a kid what you dream to do and even once you've done it, you know, multiple times, you, you still get that sort of that nervous kind of feeling, you know, pushing out for your country. So just to get that back and just to, um, you know, see where we're at on the world stage because it's been so long, really. And then also all the hype that a Paralympic Games has, you know, you, you go in as not just a wheelchair rugby team, you're, a, you're an Australian team with, with all, all athletes from all over the country in different sports. And there's there's something really cool about being a part of that that mob, that, that whole sort of whole of country uh, feel. And then it's also, you know, pretty much the main chance for our friends and family can can watch us do what we do uh, on the international stage um, on TV, especially for my sport. So um, it's getting pretty close now, you know, one month till uh, the Olympic Games and then, you know, not too long after that, the Paralympic Games. So uh, it's starting to become real, starting to feel real. I asked the same question to Curtis McGrath, um, but I'd love to get a bit more insight into the, um, the mob, um, which is... Uh, with the Paralympic team, and there seems to be just a wonderful um, spirit of camaraderie um, within that Paralympic group. Yeah, you know, like um, it, it was started, I think, after London, um, the London Games, and they sort of introduced that as, you know, that sort of bigger picture mentality. You know, you're not just your sport, you're not just yourself as an athlete, but you're one country representing, you know, our nation. Um and yeah, it's great to be a part of. It's you know we've got different mediums and forums and, and mob gatherings um, around. So our co-captains will put them on in the various states and territories in Australia, and you know invite those athletes to come together and just you know share a yarn or have a chat or you know voice their feelings or, or you know in pre-COVID times they might do a lawn bowl session or something. Where we can get together and actually meet athletes from other sports because um, a lot of athletes probably like yourself. Um, Patria, you know, you go to a Gaines village and you make friends with, with athletes from all sorts of sports. And But that's probably the only time you get to see them because everyone's so busy doing their own thing around the world. So um, the more we can sort of connect as elite athletes and in particular being Paralympic athletes, we've had our own sort of stories of, of acquiring our disability or living with disability um, to that sort of peer-to-peer peer um, relationship and engagement um, it just really helps boost you know, mental health and, and excitement and, um, and doing it as a team. You mentioned at the start there that it's a mixed sport. Do, do many women play wheelchair rugby? It's, it's increasing, yeah, year on year. So um, we've got one female athlete on our Australian team who's vying for her first Paralympic spot uh, for the first time ever in this country. Uh, she sort of really has come a long way and she holds her own now in her spot. Um, and many other countries 
countries are, are implementing females on their team. So in our sport, um, it's based on classification. Essentially, every athlete is classified by the level of disability. And um, as an incentive to get more females to play the sport, they get a 0.5 deduction on their classification when they're competing. So it can actually strategically make a big difference having a female who can hold her own in her spot, given that you can have some extra function elsewhere on court. Mm. So a lot of countries are sort of trying to tap into the stock now, getting more females to play. And, uh, you know, like countries like America, they've got um, a larger pool of athletes. Um, You know, there's even been female only competitions which is great so that will just continue to grow hopefully organically and i know um the guys in player development and pathways are really pushing more females to get involved it's, it's a great sport and it's got, a, got a rough sport at times <laughs> you know uh, it, it surprises me that there are so many women playing yeah i mean it's full contact um and 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 we don't definitely don't go easy um on the girls when they're on there um once the whistle's blown but I don't know. It's a bit like dodging cars, you know. Like the chair takes a lot of the lot of the impact, um, and you sort of learn how to fall, um, not to hurt yourself and that kind of thing when when it happens. But um, yeah, there's not that many injuries. It's just um, you know usually someone will get a big hit and everyone will go oh wow, and then they'll get up smiling. So um, yeah, it's just kind of part of a full contact sport. And you look at you know women's rugby and, and rugby league, and you know the state of origin, the women's is happening you know this week. And um, a lot of those guys will make the big hits and get up smiling as well. And that's that kind of draws them in. They're, they're inclined to that sort of that kind of nature of sport. Yes. Just want to ask you, uh, the rivalry with the United States, you have a look at London and then uh, what well, there was 59, 58 in Rio. It, it's that intense rivalry with the United States that um, is one of the highlights of your sport. It is. I mean, the game was invented in Canada, um, so pretty close to America. In America, they've got so many athletes to choose from. Um, you've just got such a, a massive domestic competition and all that sort of junior youth um, comes up and they've got all these great stocks to choose from. So they're always going to be a great team and they always have been. And, you know, we're kind of we're kind of limited in terms of the players that we have. We're just lucky that we've got an exceptional group of small group of athletes um, for the last few years in this sport. Um, but, yeah, look, I guess the thing with America, they won everything, you know, um, before – you know, London, and we kind of went into London never winning gold, um, and we actually went through undefeated in London, and uh, America, you know, got, got pipped in the semi-final by Canada, and, and we won that final convincingly, and then the thing that kind of always overshadowed that is that the Americans said, well, you never beat us, you know, so, you know, are you the best in the world, and um, that kind of sat with us, and uh, we didn't really get a, another shot because even the World Championships two years after that, same thing happened. Canada beat them in the semi, and we played them in the semi and beat Canada, and we hadn't actually played them in a final and beaten them. So it came to Rio four years later. We both went through our pools undefeated, um, met each other in the gold medal match, and that was our chance to sort of prove, well, all right, we've done everything in the game except beat America at a major event. Um, and, you know, I'd encourage everyone to go and watch the game on YouTube as it's been, you know, people have said it's a, the best game of wheelchair rugby ever. Um, and in the gold medal match, went to double overtime. We, we got them by, by one goal. So we'd finally got over that that sort of slump and uh, and got them at a major event. Um, and now they're hungry as ever to get back to us in Tokyo. And I guess that rivalry of being two exceptionally great sides will just continue. Chris, what are the um, prospects for Tokyo? You obviously, talking about the, the great rivalry with the US team, I suppose it's hard to know where all the other nations are at given the lack of competition in the last 12 months. It is hard um, to gauge because not many international teams are competing. Um, there was one in Europe recently with a few of those guys, but it wasn't televised, so we couldn't actually gauge where they're at. Um, and I almost consider ourselves pretty lucky, you know, in terms of the global scale of the pandemic and how it's played out um, in terms of case numbers and that kind of thing. At least we've managed to get a domestic competition this year with us. So we broke off into our state teams and we played each other to get a bit of a gauge. But who knows? Like, you know, um, looking at the team list, there's not too many new athletes um, in, in international teams, but it's hard to tell how other countries have been preparing and, and how they're going to go. 
I have a feeling overall, um, you know, the performance might be down a little bit given that we're a skilled sport and we're a team sport. So if you don't get together very often and you don't compete together, then your plays and, in you know, your, your offensive, defensive, skilled, you know, play, set plays uh, are probably going to be affected. Um, but the effort's definitely going to be there. Chris, just wanted to ask you, are you one of the most positive people have ever met uh, how do you remain positive because it, i'd imagine it's been a, a bit of a roller coaster over the last 16 years losing both legs at 19 you know 35 do you do you look back and think you know how did i get through it i do um i, I do look back at that i think you know in the beginning there's a lot of you know friends and family support um and i guess sports always played a massive role in my life and that was what was missing once i come out of the hospital system and I'd acquired my disability and sitting there at home going, right, what now? Like, what's my purpose now? Um, and, you know, sport gave me a vehicle to go and achieve some small goals. And I think that's probably the key thing is that I always had little goals to, to overcome and then always something to look forward to, which kind of kept me in a better mindset. So, and sport's great at that. That always has, you know, competitions year on year and, you know, milestones in terms of testing and fitness and, 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 and performance and, and that kind of thing that kind of you go incrementally, you've got, something to look forward to, something to compete at, um, which has really helped, I think, um, stay positive. And then during COVID, I mean, I love competing at the highest level. That, that's why I do it. I do it so I can compete for Australia at the highest level. I love that intensity. I love I love how great it is at that level. So, you know, we'd had four years and then something, you know, spanner in the works around, all right, we'll postpone the game is another year. And um, that was going to be my last games um, in Tokyo. So there was nothing going to be holding me back to get there um, per, on a personal note uh, in particular for, for Tokyo this year. Yes. And do you, do you find yourself inspiring other people who might be going through something similar that you went through? I mean, I mean, it was sort of a, a calamity of events almost, wasn't it? You know, with leukaemia, then the bacterial mm. infection, losing both legs and then wrist and uh, some fingers. And I, I guess you know, a lot of people go through some, some tough times. Do you find that... Some of the talks that you give inspire others to to keep on going and and possibly try sport as an outlet. Oh, oh, definitely. And the thing is, I don't even have to try that hard to inspire people. To be honest, like I don't go out of my way to inspire people. But mm. you know, even down the street, all the time, people come up. Oh, you know, it's so good, you know, to see you out and that kind of thing. And you know, um, you know, like people are right, right. I was at work, a work meeting the other day, just going going between clients, and someone on their bike sort of pulled over, is like. Um, you know, oh, that's awesome, you know, what you're doing. I'm like, what am I doing? I'm walking down the street to my car to get to my next appointment. But just the fact that people can see, obviously, I've gone through some adversity in my life, but I'm just, you know, going through my life as any any sort of 35-year-old would. You know, I'm a father, I've, I'm employed, um, and I'm also a play sport. Um, and, you know, because I have a disability, it doesn't mm. stop me achieving these things. Um, I think that's the thing that really gets through to people. Well, if he can do that and it takes him longer to get dressed in the morning and he's got to, you know, put on his cross seat legs, get a wheelchair in the car, all these bits and pieces they don't think of and just do it, in, you know, with a smile, um, that's all I need to do. And people sort of take that in and they sort of reflect on their life and, okay, well, what will I do to, to better myself today in their own minds? Chris, I'm interested to know of of all the sports you could have chosen to do. Um, obviously, wheelchair rugby is known as murder ball and quite brutal. So, what what attracted you to that mm. sport? Yeah, I grew up playing rugby league mainly with my brother as a youngster, um, and then at school we did all kinds of all kinds of sports. You know, cricket, volleyball, rugby union, swimming, all that kind of thing. Um, but I don't know, when, when I got sick, I kind of wanted to get back into a sport. And then at the rehabilitation unit, they said, all you'd be able to do is swimming. So I, I did try it, but I've kind of, I was never great at swimming. You know, I was more of a more of a runner, um, to be honest. And But I gave it a go just to sort of get a feel of, of sport as a person with a disability and maybe a pathway to representative level at some point. And then, yeah, I was just in the gym and uh, one of the, the coaches, head coach from the rugby team was there and said, oh, you know, have you ever thought of wheelchair rugby? I was like, I don't even know what it is, you know. Um, and he invited me to a training camp and, yeah, I got there and um, watched the Aussie guys do what they do and I was kind of awe inspired by how quick it was and how cool it was and um, and that sort of team camaraderie and, and the ball skills. And I was like, yeah, this is something I'd love to try. And then from the first second I jumped in, hit the chair and, brought me back to the rugby league days and um, I just, yeah, just did not look back from there. 
you, you've got an identical twin brother. Do, do you sort of uh, still muck around a bit together? 35 years of age, I guess you, you're growing up a little bit now and as you said, you've got kids. Do, do you sort of um, you still wrestle each other and uh, as as twins often do? Oh, well, there's been a couple of boxing matches after, <laughs> you know, some barbecues and that, but um, <laughs> just settle old scores. But uh, no, we both, you know, both got kids now and um but we're both extremely competitive um i think you know that's kind of helped me in my sporting career growing up with with someone who's two minutes younger than me trying to be better than me at everything and we just push each other to be better um and always had someone by my side to to race against or you know whatever it may be so um but yeah look the other weekend we went took our kids to the park and we set up some some cricket stumps and got a bat and ball out and we were you know bowling as fast as we could to get each other <laughs> out. So I don't think it ever ends. Uh, um, but yeah, it's nice. We're, as we're older, we kind of are a bit more closer now than we used to be. So, um, yeah. yeah, it is nice. Yeah. What, what would it mean to you if you won a third gold medal at the Paralympics, a third in a row, having won London, Rio, and then Tokyo? What, what do you think it would mean? I mean, yeah, it's amazing. You know, to win one gold medal is all I set out to do. Um, and all I set out to do beyond that is just add value to the team and do the best I can do um, to help our team. But that being said, you know, I've won two gold medals, but our current team as a whole has won nothing. Um, we've got guys who've never been to a round of the games before. Um, but I think end of the day, I just want to leave a legacy. I'm getting, you know, I'm getting on. It's my third games. Um, could be my last. Um, I just want to leave a, leave a legacy in the sport that we are the best at it. You know, Australia is the best wheelchair rugby team in the world. And if I'm a part of that, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that happens. Um, whether that's an ego thing, I'm not sure, but um, I just want us to be the best in that sport on there. That's great. Um, so post-Tokyo, um, what, what does life have in store for you if it, if it, if it is your last games? Yeah, I haven't thought too hard about that, Petria. Um, you know, I've got my daughter. She's a year and a year and a half old now, and myself and my partner Bridie are probably looking at having another child um, soon. So, those with kids knows that it takes up a lot of your time. It's already sort of taking up a lot of our priority. Um, I do work at the Australian Sports Foundation, so um, I'll have even more time to to commit to to uh, getting more more money into sport uh, through my role there. Um, and you know, I've also taken on you know, um, a role as a board member for Disability Sports Australia. So there's a big part of me who'll always want to keep giving back to sport and sort of paying it forward and and paving the way for the the next Chris Bond, you know, coming through or the next person that's acquired a disability and want to get wants to get into sport. Um, trying to remove some of the barriers to that, I think. Um, but look, that that sort of competitive part of me will always will always compete. So I'll I'll play wheelchair rugby probably till I physically cannot um, at a social level and and probably uh, maybe even at a state level. Um, that's for sure. Yes, you might need an outlet for that competitive spirit. Uh, Chris, uh, thanks very much for joining us and um, it, it's been great having a chat with yourself and I know Patria gets a lot out of these these conversations, don't you, Patria? Even though you've been to the Olympics numerous times, you've won three Olympic gold medals, every time we have a, a chat with some of our elite athletes, I know that you get a lot out of it. Yeah, absolutely. It's great to hear the stories of others and um, I find it really inspiring to, to hear their stories and how they've overcome their own challenges along the pathway. Chris, thanks very much for joining us on Onside today, where our Clean and Gold series continues. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for chair. You're listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Look at her go. Kim Brennan closing in on gold, 100 to go. Mum and Dad are in the front of the stands cheering. They're going wild. Kim Brennan, take it home, girl. Take it home. Two kilometres as the crow flies, and no one is faster than Kim Brennan. She completes her set. Gold to Australia. The 31-year-old's four-year mission complete. Take a bow, Kim Brennan. She ends Australian rowing's eight-year gold medal drought. On Sport Integrity, Australia's Clean and Gold podcast series in the lead-up to the Olympics and Paralympics, we're speaking to prominent Olympians and Paralympians. And alongside me is the triple Olympic gold medalist, Patria Thomas. And joining us is the Olympic rowing gold medalist from the Rio Olympics, Kim Brennan. And Kim became the first Australian to win the single skulls and the female single skulls at the Olympic Games. And Kim, uh, welcome to the podcast. Um, brings back some great memories, no doubt, with the the postponed Olympics uh, just on our doorstep, but ready to get underway. 
Oh, it really, it really does. Um, it's actually, it's a really nice position to be in, to be able to um, to watch from the comfort of home. Um, I've been fortunate to see um, to see how well, particularly our rowing team are doing, but also some great results coming in from a range of sports. And very, very excited to see these athletes get their chance to shine. It's certainly been a real test of resilience, um, of overcoming adversity. And um, I think it'll be, It'll be a fascinating experience from them that I'm sure everyone will learn a huge amount from. You were going to go across as the Deputy Chef Commissioner of the Australian team, but you pulled out, uh, you've given birth five months ago and decided, listen, it wasn't worth the risk. Yeah, yeah, it was. It was a really, it was a really hard position to be in. I'm obviously incredibly passionate about the Olympic movement and about the Olympic team, um, and would have loved to have uh, headed over to the games. But um, baby Violet joined us five months ago, and I, I, I figured travelling um, with a five month old in a pandemic was probably not the most responsible thing that I could do. Um, and very fortunate to be able to hand over the reins to a very close friend and fellow member of the. Um, Australian Olympic Committee Athletes Commission, Kenny Wallace, um, who will do an exceptional job um, in that role. Kim, you would have had all the inside knowledge being um, obviously Deputy Chef over the last couple of years. Um, What do you expect Tokyo to be like for the athletes, knowing all the planning that's gone in behind the scenes? It's going to be an Olympics like no other. I think the thing I've been most impressed with is, you know, over the period – the the organisation team and the high performance team have really had to flex really really well to be able to create an environment where athletes can can perform, but also balance the safety measures that are going to need to be in place. Um, a lot of what we're talking to the athletes about is really about preparing for everything um, and anything, um, and realising that everyone's in the same boat. I'm just going to pick up my child. <laughs> Here we go. You can sit on my lap. Um, so it's um, it's really going to be the people who deal best with adversity who do the best at these games. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of lot of idle time sitting in rooms, um, and that's something that you know those who go prepared and who are comfortable with their own thoughts, um, I think, are going to be the ones who really relish the opportunity to get out there and and compete because it's it's been a really long time for a lot of our athletes to actually get onto the competition field. Kim, I just wanted to find out from you, I mean, what would be going through the minds of the athletes this close to the Olympic Games, given you were there, you've been there a couple of times, but what would it be going, what would be going through the minds of the athletes right now? Look, I think they're very focused on on what it is that, that makes them perform well, and it's actually a really good space place to be in. I mean, one of the advantages of, of having less travel and less competition is that they've had the opportunity to have really good training blocks um, and they've had the opportunity to really, you know, hone in on on what makes them perform well. Um, we're seeing some amazing results coming out of the rowing team, the swimming team, the track and field team. Um, and I think now is really, you know, it, it actually doesn't matter all of the noise and the circus that happens around you at an Olympic Games because your job is still the the same. You've got to go out there and be the best that you can possibly be. Um, you go out there and um, you make sure that everything you've done in training, you actually are able to put out there on on race day or competition day. Um, and so I think really you know, that that bubble that they're living in um, is very much a bubble that every Olympian goes into the closer they get um, to, to an Olympic Games. It's just that this one is a bubble that a lot more of Australia are also in at the same time time. Kim, you've had a wonderful career, international career at world championship level, Olympic level. Um, and I saw a quote how you, th- you know, the medals were great, but it was the journey that was so important to you. Can you just tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it's, um, it's something that I think as the years pass uh, since the games, it becomes more and more true. Um, you realise that sport teaches you a huge amount about who you are and what you believe in um, and it also teaches you a lot of the um, the skills and the ways of teaming with others that hold you in really good stead for the rest of your life and so you know what I've really reflected on is that you know the, the medal is wonderful but 
ultimately it was all of the um, it was the journey and the striving that went into the medal that has actually made me the person that I am and it's that that's given me so many opportunities beyond um, beyond the rowing course and beyond sport to actually use those skills in a different way um, and it's you know when I look back on the things that I'm most appreciative for I am so incredibly lucky to have had um, you know an amazing coach an amazing support team my family was so supportive. My husband, um, so many people around me um, actually made that possible. And regardless of whether on race day, you know, I had have um, won that race or not, is actually in some ways a bit irrelevant to how much that taught me and, um, you know, how grateful I am for having had that experience so that's really what I'm getting at there and I think it's something that the benefit of hindsight um, can really you know can really help appreciate how lucky we are as athletes. Did the Olympic gold medal change your life? I I think so similar to the question before the striving for the gold medal changed my life because it taught me um, how to focus on on an outcome and, and work in a team to achieve it. Um, it taught me about the importance of um, the importance of, of kindness, of looking out for others, of always trying to be better, of taking feedback, of communicating well. Um, and they're things that have changed my life um, because they've given me wonderful opportunities um, and they've really, you know, enabled me to, to have a life that I thoroughly enjoy. Um, so the gold medal in some ways is a symbol for what that taught me. Um, so I think the process and the learnings have changed my life. Um, but, you know, let, let's say I had have fallen in in the final and not won that race. I think I would have still learnt so many of those things. Kim, you've um, been involved um, in sports since your retirement in 2016. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about how important the athlete's voice is? And I know you've been on the um, AOC Athletes Commission and, and doing a lot of good work there. So, yeah, if you could just take us through how important the athlete's voice is. Oh, look, I think it's, I think it's incredibly important because I think there's a, you know, there's a part of sport that culturally in some sports um, it has been about, you know, athletes being, um, you know, essentially numbers in the system that you get told what to do when you do what you're told um, and if you train hard enough for long enough that you'll do well. But that's really not my belief in what high-performance sport is. I think high-performance sport is actually really about that um, that learning together. Um, and so having a voice as an athlete in to have control of your own destiny I think is really important. But I think it's also really important for athletes to be heard in designing the system that impacts them. Um, and it's something that has really been gaining a lot of traction over the past over the past few years. But really, it's um, it, it's just as simple as in anything that we do. It's really important to understand what motivates people, what is important, how to make sure that everyone is mentally healthy, that they're happy, that they're enjoying themselves, that they're being respected, that there are open lines of communication. Um, and it should be no different for athletes. Um, it equally goes for um Coaches being able to have a voice, support staff being respected and being able to have a voice, everyone who is a part of that high-performance sports system um, and sports system right down to the grassroots, um, being involved and in control of, of the outcomes and the destiny rather than having things happen to you, which I think can often leave people um, potentially with a bitter taste in their mouth at the end of a sporting career because you have given so much of your, your passion, your energy and your time um, but for whatever reason, um, you haven't had the, um, I guess, the privilege and the opportunity of what of what I had in 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 my case of um, growing as an individual, but also growing as a team. And um, I think that voice is a critical component of that. And, and along those lines, you've been a very strong anti-doping advocate and um, ensuring that there is a an even and clean playing field for all sports people. Yeah, definitely. I think. Um, you know, I've I've been very lucky in in rowing that in a lot of ways rowing have been at the forefront um, of the doping effort for a really long time and potentially because there isn't that much money in it, um, doping hasn't been as big a problem um, 
for compared to some other sports, um, which has meant that you have the opportunity to be able to sit on the start line and know that um, you can win the race regardless of um, you know who else might might turn up because you trust that um, the system are actually looking out for a level playing field. Um, I think it is really important that um, we continue that conversation around um, you know the anti-doping rules are actually there to protect athletes. Um, and it's not to say that they don't need to change over time um, to accommodate changes in technology or what we're learning about um, fairness or or what we're learning in that space. Um, but I think often there is, you know, a narrative that um, doping control testers are out there to out there to get athletes. When the reality is that when you have someone knock on your door and come and test you, that's actually part of protecting the sport so you can line up and have that opportunity to excel on the world stage because it is fair and it is clean. So I've always been incredibly grateful for um, for the role that anti-doping has played um, in preserving that level playing field and, and giving me the opportunities that I did have. Kim, with the Games only a few weeks away, what advice would you have given um, athletes um, had you been still in your role as uh, Deputy Chef? I think, um, you know, the advice is that things are going to go wrong. It is going to be a difficult game. Um, I don't think anyone can predict exactly what will happen and when, um, but the people who succeed are the ones who deal best with adversity. And so, you know, one of my um, one of my beliefs that I've always had is um, you, you go out there and you see every challenge as a great opportunity. It's sort of, you know, this went wrong, fantastic. How can I make that work to my advantage? Because the reality is things are going to be hard for everyone um, and the people who are the most resilient and um, can keep a smile on their face and still go out there and perform despite the fact it might be hot, the mask might be uncomfortable, you might be stuck in your room, um, you know, the bus might break down, you may not get breakfast, your boat may not turn up, all of those things, um, embrace that, expect that um, and go out there and, and have your best crack at it anyway. Yes, looking forward to the Olympics and also the Paralympics. And I know, Petrea, you know, it's one of the highlights of your life, but you have expressed, you know, sort of, I guess, in the past talked about the journey rather than the, the whole thing. And I'm, I'm sure that a lot of athletes are going to go through that that whole experience over the next month or so. Thanks very much for joining us, Kim. And I'm not sure what's harder, um, combating the choppy waters in Rio or, or juggling a five-month-old as you, as you have a chat with us this morning. But thanks very much for multi-skilling and, and thanks very much for joining Onside's Clean and Gold series. Wonderful. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, Kim. Here's Australian water polo star and our athlete educator, Bronwyn Knox, with her top tips for competing clean. Bromwell will be competing in a fourth Olympic Games in Tokyo. My top three tips for clean sport is easy. There's only one, the app, the app, the app. It's got absolutely everything from checking your supplements, checking your medications, to learning and understanding more about the rules or the doping testing procedures. So for me, it's the app. Go check it, download it, have it on your home screen. It's imperative that you get it. Wishing you all the best in Tokyo, Bromwell. The Sport Integrity Australia app was developed by Sport Integrity Australia to help Australian athletes compete clean. The app enables you to check medications on Global Draw, find low-risk batch-tested supplements and includes information on match-fixing, illicit drugs, TUEs, the testing process, whereabouts and more. Thanks for listening to Sport Integrity Australia's Clean and Gold podcast series. And uh, Patria, we've learned a lot today from from Kim Brennan and, and Chris Bond. Yeah, it's been a pleasure talking to them, actually. They both have remarkable stories and, and are great um, Australian competitors. And we're going to be back in a fortnight in the lead up to the Olympics and also the Paralympics on Onside's Clean and Gold podcast series. You've been listening to Onside, the official podcast of Sport Integrity Australia. Send in your podcast questions or suggestions to media at sportintegrity.gov.au. For more information on Sport Integrity Australia, please visit our website, www.sportintegrity.gov.au or check out our Clean Sport app.